Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Remember that disgusting Commodore 64 that we saw a few weeks ago? Well, this is what it looks like right now, and it's better, but it's not great. We also identified a few faulty chips, but we never got around to powering on the board. So today our goal is not just to fix the Commodore 64, but to also make it look good. The first thing I'm going to do is look at the tracks in the back that had the corrosion and see how bad the damage is. Let's look at those tracks under the microscope. I'm looking for the big spot. There we go. I'm going to try and scrape the rust with a small screwdriver very gently. I just want to see what's underneath. Hmm, it's actually coming off pretty nicely. And even though this is a small screwdriver, it's still pretty big. I'm going to use a needle instead. Yes, we're pretty zoomed in. And this is kind of amazing, but the rust is coming off and the track seems to be intact underneath. Let's dig in some more. And yeah, it looks like the rust didn't need into the track at all. How weird. Let's look for another one of those big spots. And same thing. They just come off. This is kind of amazing. I was not expecting this at all. So amazingly, those tracks might be fine. They totally looked like there was a hole of rust, but maybe the space between the tracks got rusted and sort of spilled over the tracks themselves. So really what we should do is just measure continuity because all these tracks are going to the cartridge connector. So I want to make sure that all those traces are conductive and it doesn't seem that way, but it's actually pretty difficult to follow a trace through all that maze of traces. I, at least I get lost pretty quickly. I start going, uh, and then I just get lost. I'm up, one up, one down. So I think just the easiest way to do this reliably is going one by one through the cartridge connectors and then finding a place on the board where they match. I can do it blind since probably a lot of those are going to be either the CPU over here or the VIC-2 chip over here or some of those connectors and somehow if that doesn't work then I can actually look at the schematics and be oh okay fine this particular signal comes from some other logic chip but that we can start that um, as a start like that so I'll just do it quickly oh there you go so I don't even know what it is but the one is connected right there to the to the VIC-2 chip Oh, there you go. So I'll just continue doing that with all of them. Wow. So surprisingly, they're all connected correctly to other parts of the board. That's really good. So I don't want to make this any worse, but maybe what I'll do is I'll apply some lacquer to just prevent oxygen from getting there and the corrosion getting any worse and eventually get into the tracks. Hopefully that's good enough. I'm not going to try to clean them up um, any more than I did because those were the biggest ones and I'm afraid that if I do that maybe I'll just make it worse. So hopefully just covering it and preventing the corrosion from spreading will be good enough. We're almost at the point that we can start testing the board with some chips in it. So the only thing that concerns me before starting that is the state of the sockets, especially the CPU, PLA, and VIC-2, since those are the most crucial sockets. And just because this poor computer has been through so much, so I'm going to have a look at them under the microscope, and let's see what we find in there. So the contacts on those sockets aren't the greatest and they're the kind of sockets that I really don't like that only have, I forget the exact name for it, but they only have a contact on one side, not on both sides, like modern sockets, even the super cheapy sockets. But I don't want to pull them out just yet. And that, it turns out, was a really bad idea. Remember that for later. 
so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some uh, contact cleaner or some of you know use deoxid. So I'll apply some of this and then and then brush it over like that. And that should hopefully be good enough. If not, we'll definitely replace it if we see that there are any problems with making good contact. Looking at the sockets under the microscope again, the contacts seem better. So hopefully that will be good enough. And if not, we'll find out soon enough. Okay, so we are ready for our first test and I'm going to put the bare minimum. So I'm gonna put the CPU, the PLA and the VIC2 chip. Let's not forget, we also need the fuse, which I've tested and it's still working. For the test, I'm also going to use the power supply that came with the computer. And this one just cleaned up really nicely. Just had to use some cleaner, just a minor rust spot in there, but yeah, that looks good. The only thing I noticed that I want to do something about is the rust in the connector itself, but some sandpaper should just deal with that. There you go. It's, um, it doesn't look very good, but it's nice and smooth. And this is not really crucial. I mean, all of this con is the contact for ground. So the important thing, well, obviously it's that it makes some contact there and then are the pins inside, which those are not rusted fortunately. So I think we're good to go. And to make extra sure that everything is okay, I'm going to go through a power saver. So I connect the power supply here, and then I don't connect this to the Commodore 64 yet, but these LEDs will let us know if it's getting the right currents or if this is too low or what's going on. So I'm gonna turn it on now, and it looks like it's perfect. We got nine volts and the five volts are within the acceptable range. So I think the power supply is good. One last thing I wanna do before we turn it on is to check the switch, especially because this area was so dirty at the beginning. The easiest thing is to do it on the bottom of the board. So when it's off, well, it shouldn't matter too much when it's off, but when it's off, it connects, right, those two. And when I turn it on, it connects those two. Okay, it looks perfect. So we're going to use the dead test cartridge. And at this point, I'll be thrilled if we just see any image on the screen. I fully expect something not to work. Okay, so here goes nothing. We get a signal at least because that went away. And it often takes a couple minutes, not a couple minutes, it takes about 10 seconds. Whoa, we do get an image at the beginning. This is great. Well, we knew that those three chips are working, but really, the majority of the signals on the board are working. Now it's checking the RAM and it's amazing that it seems to be working. So, wow, that's, um, that's amazing that <laughs> we've, we've gotten this far. These Commodore 64 boards are pretty sturdy, a lot sturdier than you think, a lot sturdier than an Amstrad board, for example. It's actually amazing that the RAM and a lot of these chips seem to be working. Well, clearly the sound test is not working because we don't have the SIT connected. And that's it. Now it's just going to the next iteration. So, wow. At least as far as the dead test cartridge, this is completely working. So let's put the rest of the chips in and see if we get a basic prompt. So the CIAs are the chips that were faulty when we tested it last time. So I have two spare CIAs. So let's go ahead and try it. If all goes well, we should get the basic prompt. And there we go. Oh, although I noticed we're not getting the blinking cursor. So something is not quite right. This was the same problem we had when I put one of the other two CIAs on the other board. Could be a bad connection from one of those sockets. It could be that one of those CIAs is bad. They were tested a long time ago. Let's start by bringing known good CIAs from my other computer. Okay, so we have the two CIAs from the other computer and let's see if we get that cursor. Okay, we don't. Very interesting. So especially because this is exactly what we saw when we had a bad CIA before, I'm leaning towards the problem being bad contact in one of these sockets. So I'm gonna have to do this off camera because it's 
really difficult to film it, but I'm going to check continuity. So I'm going to be touching one of the leads here and then the solder point in the back for all of them. And if any of them don't make good contact, then that's definitely that. So I checked all the pins and they all had continuity test fine to the other side at least. I didn't check the traces from here to you know, the CPU and things like that. That would be next. One thing I want to do before I do that is to see if the computer is actually frozen or it actually responds to the keyboard. So I'm going to connect the keyboard and see if we can type letters and if it's just that the cursor is missing. Okay. And it looks like we can't do anything. Okay. That's that's good to know. Back in the thing keeps pointing to that CIA. So what I'm gonna have to do now is make sure that the traces correctly reach everywhere in the board. Maybe we have one of those rusted spots in the back that I didn't notice that is preventing, that is pretty much cut one of those traces and preventing the signals from getting there correctly. So it's a little awkward because I need to hold it like this and touch one part with the probe here and one in the back. So I'm gonna start with pin 39. Here we go. And now I move to pin 40 and I get nothing. And this, you have to be careful when you do this because sometimes if you press a little hard when you're testing for continuity, that's enough to push the I see in a little bit and actually make contact. And as soon as you let go, then it's not making contact again. That can drive you crazy. But anyway, we should definitely replace that socket. And it has made me reconsider that maybe we should replace the other ones, but let's just go with that one for now. So one thing to always remember is that before you desolder something, you need to remove the chip. Especially if that chip was previously desoldered because then it probably has a little bit of solder in the legs and if you desolder it it will most likely get soldered to the socket itself and that would be a mess to undo yeah i wonder if that's not just some corrosion but the typical problem of a single-sided contact it just gets pushed in a little too much either because we put in other um, chips before or maybe when i was cleaning it and then the leg of the integrated circuit was not making contact in there yeah i i hate these sockets Let's put the CPU back in place. And I can even check really quickly that that signal is connected now. Should be that and that. There we go. Okay, let's see if that works now. Wow, still nothing. There's still something else preventing the cursor from being there. So I checked all the other connections and they all seemed fine. As I was looking at the signals going into the CIA, I noticed that maybe a possible candidate for making this one to misbehave is chip select and that is in pin 23 and it's active low and as we're looking at it i'm going to turn the computer off and back on we just never see it go low so yeah i mean the cia is not active no wonder we're getting weird results so that signal is coming from a demultiplexer this is a, two, a dual 224 demultiplexer, and it's enabled in one side, it's enabled in pin one, and that should be active low again. But let's turn it off and on. And okay, we get a burst at least of activity. And so that means that while that is happening, the inputs, which are pins two and three, there's definitely a lot of activity there and some activity there, it should turn on one of the pins four, five, six, or seven, but only when output enable is low. And in particular, 
pin 7 then is used as the pin enable for the other half. So let's look at pin 7. And there was some noise in there, but there was nothing really a signal going low. I'm turning it off and on. Oh, there, there, there we definitely got some, but we never get any in pin 7. Yeah, just a little bit of noise at the time where we should be getting some. And then because of that, pin 15 is just never enabled, which then means that the output in here is just never enabled, and the CIA is just never enabled either. Oh, and by the way, this chip had some rust in there. You can see some rust in there, some rust in there. So maybe it's one of those that just got sufficiently damaged when, when I've noticed that when rust starts creeping up on the pins, um, I don't know if it just keeps going inside or something, but maybe it damages some of the connections to the central core of the circuit. So maybe we should try taking this out and trying a replacement. So I just ran it through the tester on the EEPROM programmer like I've done other times, and it comes up as faulty. So this is definitely a good thing. We removed it. It may not be the only thing. There's definitely a few other rusty spots, but we know for sure this one is not working correctly. So don't, I don't have any spares. So I'm gonna grab the one from the other Commodore 64 and see if that helps any. Okay, once again, let's try it. Okay, now we get the blinking cursor. So that's great. There may be something else that is failing. I don't have one of those comprehensive hardness tests, which are great to pinpoint problems with maybe some other ports or something, but this is really, really encouraging. One thing that I wanted to do was repair those edge connectors a little bit better. Yeah, I know we can make connection. There's enough material there, but it would be nice to preserve it a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some solder just a little bit of it, and then I'm going to remove it with a wicking braid to try to leave just like the tiniest little bit of a coating. So just do a couple of the pads, yeah, just like that first. So clearly, you don't want to leave them like that. And now, if we do this right, yeah, there you go. Look at that, much better, much more shiny more material. So let's do the same thing with the other ones. We can clean it with a little bit of alcohol as usual. And we can try applying there again. So it didn't regrow the track. You just can't cover those places where there's no uh, material anymore, but it certainly made it more protected for the future. And now I'll go ahead and do the same thing in this one. There you go. It's definitely much better and much more protected for the future. If this had gone a little bit longer, then I think we would have started having some problems and then we would have had to use a different solution to really lay down some new material in there. Now it's, it's possible to do that and you need some either special product or you could even solder or attach somehow pads, new whole new pads in there. But hopefully this is good enough. So just for completeness and before we try with the game, I want to run the dead test cartridge again and specifically listen out for the sound of the SID because I marked this with an OK check mark and really all it means is that it doesn't prevent the computer from booting up. So <laughs> that's not a very good test. Let's see if we get some sound out of it. Well, we got some sound, but the volume seemed weird in there. It seemed to be cutting in and out. Whoa, and what is that? We got the text, but it's all clearly... 
I don't know, it's almost like it's filled in or... That is really weird. That was a little weird. So um, I'm going to try a different diagnostic. This is with um, EC Flash 3. Huh. I don't know if you caught that. There was a weird noise in there. That doesn't sound quite right either. Whoa, what is that? That is really weird. Like, and then it goes away. Get all this garbage. Oh, and then it says some things are bad. Wow. <laughs> this is in worse shape than I thought. And yet the color RAM and the 64K RAM seem to come up okay. Some of those bad things, that's fine. That's because we don't have the hardness um, connected. So here's what I'm thinking. We're seeing weird video issues. We're getting weird sound issues. I think I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and replace the sockets in those and probably the uh, PLA as well, just to be sure. And then if we still have this going on, we can diagnose it further. Halfway there, out with the horrible sockets, in with the new. With the new chips in, let's run the diagnostics test again and see if that helps any. Now, still there. And it's like on this side of the screen too, which is weird. And then the characters are like thick. And then the sound seem, seems to have problems still. So yeah, that's not encouraging. I mean, it could still be a bad contact on something. Like, oh. oh. So this is the character ROM and I can control the amount of weirdness on the screen just by pushing it around. Yeah, look at that. So that's definitely some bad context going on there. Okay, so really I just need to go back and take out all the original sockets. I, You know what, I should have listened to myself two hours ago. I said that and then I said, well, but maybe I won't do that yet until I need to. Nah, I should have done it from the beginning. So really that means the ROMs and the CIAs need to go. And now let's put the chips back and test it. Okay, let's do that test again. And nothing. So why was I getting that moving? I can still control that. So is it something in the board? If I move the CPU, no. But if I move the, this, okay, I'm gonna put a different character ROM. Again, I'm borrowing the one from the other Commodore 64 that we know works perfectly fine. So if it changes now when I press it, then there's something in the board, some track or something that has been somehow um, affected by that. Interesting, so with this one, not a problem at all. I wonder if it's possible that this is just not making good contact because it's kind of dirty. So let's, um, let's clean it a little bit more. Okay, I've cleaned this up a little bit and uh, let's see if that makes a difference. Okay, so it really looks like this chip is busted in a really strange way. All right, well, that's easy enough to replace with an EEPROM and an adapter. So really, I should really remove this. I don't want to get confused and then think that this is working. That's the beauty of these Sharpies that they're pretty permanent, but when you want to, you can remove them. There we go. So for now, I'll just replace it with the ROM from the other computer, but um, I'll eventually make an adapter for an EEPROM. And I just want to make sure that everything is working, including the SID, which I'm not sure really about. So first let's try some music that I can recognize. Yeah, like even that sounds really noisy. But this one should be pretty clear. It's not as clear as I was hoping it would be. What about the commando music?
Mostly it's just really noisy. Okay, let's try with an actual SID test program that will isolate the different voices. So there's an additional... Yeah, there's definitely additional sounds that shouldn't be there. All right, enough of that. Let's try a different SID. Okay, new SID in place. Wow. Much louder, too. So, yeah, clearly that one is not good. So that means we can go back to the SID tune that I was trying to play earlier. Yeah, even that sounds better. Okay, that sounds right. We finally got the board working. I'm actually surprised that the tracks in the back with those pits were actually working, but then we had so many faulty chips. And especially it's frustrating that we found a fault in the SID chip because those are not easy to replace. I'm actually thinking of making a future video of modern replacements for SID chips and then comparing them among each other. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if not, you know what to do. And uh, also leave me a comment below explaining why you didn't like it. I actually read all the comments and I learn a fair amount of things from them. So don't be shy. Anyway, see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.